This program is brought to you by the University of Michigan. For more information, visit umich.edu. Hello, I'm Alan Keyes, 1996 Republican presidential hopeful. Please lend me your ears for just five minutes. I want to consider this week the implications of a cartoon strip appearing last week, March 7th, 2002 in the New York Times and other places by a Mr. Ted Rawl, mocking the grief of those who loved, lost loved ones in the 9-11 attacks, and the widow of Daniel Pearl. Several quotations from the comic will suffice. They're eerily calm. They smile and crack jokes and laugh out loud. They are the scourge of the media, terror widows. M Mrs. Pearl. Of course, it's a bummer that they slashed my husband's throat, but the worst was having to watch the Olympics alone. Another widow. I keep waiting for Kevin to come home, but I know he never will. Fortunately, the 3.2 million I collected from the Red Cross keeps me warm at night. And so on. Among the many responsibilities and privileges of a free people, one of its noblest is the task of forming and maintaining principled resolve in time of war. Citizens of the free American Republic must supply something beyond what was demanded of the subjects of warlike kingdoms, along with willing soldiers and a beehive of impassioned support at home. We must supply as well the sustained national act of will to prosecute the war and this will must be formed from a genuine understanding that our cause is just. Our leaders can and must help in this. Indeed, there may be no more important responsibility they face than ensuring that we only wield the sword when our cause is just, but the ultimate responsibility is ours. Of course, an entire people cannot have so perfect an understanding as its statesmen of the causes that justify, even require going to war. Human history, has taught us time and time again that as the simple faith of the, pleasant, of the peasant necessarily lacks much of the precision of the theologian's doctrine, so the judgment of any nation will always lack much of the sophistication of the statesman's subtle reasoning. But like the faith of the holy peasant, the people's grasp of the essential realities can be astonishingly complete and deep, even wise, when it is in a form that a cynic might find simplistic. Thus, the importance of such events, such images as Pearl Harbor, a flame, and the Lusitania sinking beneath the waves, these events become slogans precisely because the proximate cause of a just war, which exemplifies the evil being fought has to be remembered for what it was if the people are to maintain their steady judgment and purpose. Such events are essential icons of the people's faith that their cause is just. The World Trade Center stands in history with Pearl Harbor. It was an occasion of profound grief, personal and national, for those lost. That grief embodies the cause for which our young men and women are risking their lives and dying now. To ridicule the grief is to attack the cause of the war. It is to assault something vital to the moral support required for the war effort. 
Should such a cartoonist be punished, arrested, shot at dawn? Or does any such suggestion violate principles which are themselves crucial to the cause we might fight to defend? To answer these questions, we must first of all retain our confidence in certain moral judgments, in our capacity to make certain basic distinctions. Serious debate about the war and its purpose is crucial. And freedom to conduct this debate in Congress and elsewhere must be non-negotiable in all but the most genuinely extreme circumstances. But this brutal and inhuman comic strip was not debate. It was an assault on the decent national sensibilities crucial to the war effort. Such assaults are a kind of pornography in civil discourse. And like our response to pornographers, our toleration of Mr. Rawl and our means for dealing with him are matters for prudential consideration. A free people should normally suppress such activities through private moral judgment and association. Pornographers Pornographers should be shunned by all, and likewise, Mr. Ted Rawl should have been fired immediately by those with professional authority over him or in contractual relations with him. Such action in defense of the decent judgment of this people in regard to 9-11 would be more than sufficient to keep such as Mr. Rawl from subverting our national resolve. But it is worth remembering that when serious and sustained attempts to undermine public opinion on a matter genuinely essential to national life cannot be resisted by other means, governmental action may be necessary. For governmental action is also the action of a free people. Such was the case, despite all the continuing petulant complaints of superficial civil libertarians, when President Lincoln was obliged to, sub obliged to suppress rebellion in some northern citizens some of whom happened to be newspaper editors, so that the rebellion of many more Southern citizens could be effectively ended. And when our great civil war to maintain the Union brought to a victorious conclusion, then, as today, assaults on the decent judgment of American citizens regarding the just and noble character of a national struggle are literally attempts to poison the Southern. We, the people, are that southern, sovereign. And we should not tolerate those who seek to debase our judgment and destroy our unity and resolve. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn the podium over to Mr. Ted Rawl. <laughs> He's a syndicated cartoonist, author, talk show host, and graphic novelist. He was the 1996 Pulitzer Prize finalist and two-time RFK Journalism Award winner. He is also listed as number 15 in Bernard Goldberg's best-selling book, 100 People Who Are Screwing Up America. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gleckner, and uh, thanks to the University of Michigan for inviting me here tonight. It's great to be here. Uh, bef just to, before I start showing some comics, just for the benefit of those of you who may or may not be familiar with my work, I just want to reiterate that uh, anybody who uh, has any commentary uh, during that slideshow should shut the hell up until I'm done, and then at any point after that, I'm open to interruptions, insults, comments, uh, questions, that sort of thing. So. Um, Without uh, further ado, I also want to make clear, I, want to, I feel like the shirt needs some explanation tonight. Um, you know, this is my Fox News shirt that I usually wear when I'm on uh, Bill O'Reilly's show or, uh, or Hannity and Combs. And uh, the reason I wear this shirt always, um, it only gets worn on Fox News and at the University of Michigan, um, is because television producers will always tell you if you're a guest to wear blue no matter what, because it, any other color kind of looks bad. And, uh, and so orange is the worst possible color on national television. And so it's my little way of fighting the man. Uh, and, and I did not know, of course, that there was going to be an orange background and that my head would be floating aimlessly here. So, so the freak out factor is even better than I'd hoped. So. 
and uh, before we start the festivities tonight, um, I want to take a poll, a survey. I'm going to have to step out of the light to see the results. Um, who would, which uh, would you rather spend an evening with? The one-eyed kitten or one-eyed kitten? One-eyed kitten. All right, so one-eyed kitten. Pop, who's up? All right. The other one? All right. One-eyed kitten. The one-eyed kitten can't help himself. It's sad, right? The one-eyed kitten. I would adopt the one-eyed kitten. My cat would eat it, but you know. Bush? No, okay. I wanted, I, I really, you know, I don't normally get an opportunity to project um, this man's face on a 20-foot screen, and I just noticed in Photoshop that nose. He, that guy did not choke on a pretzel, I'm just saying. All right. Okay, this was a cart I'm just going to run through some recent cartoons, um, and then we can have a discussion. Uh, this was Santa Bush, uh, came out uh, Christmas a few weeks ago. Uh, a cartoon that actually you would imagine would have provoked quite a bit of controversy. Uh, I want with the v Iraq war vet saying that he wants his legs back, and Bush, who I always draw as an evil Latin American dictator with hairy ears. The ha ear hairs are new, they've grown throughout his presidency. His teeth have become longer and sharper and more fang-like. Uh, is, uh, cr wants his old popularity back. Uh, this, this one's based on a new trend. I don't know if you are aware, there's, um, the Democratic Party seems to be digging up uh, veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq, particularly those who've suffered injuries in those wars, to run for Congress. There's nothing particularly new about this. Uh, Bob Dole was kind of recruited to run for Congress uh, from Kansas back in the day and uh, as, a, as a veteran of World War II. And so this, but the, this is the first time that the Democrats have started to do it, so I just thought, uh, in order to pick on Democrats as, as much as I pick on Republicans, it was important to do this cartoon. Democrats have found a way to counter the Republicans' traditional advantage on national security. Unlike those wimps, I'll keep you safe. Baggett, war wimp, I'm a liberal Democrat, and I lost two legs in Iraq. Republicans are startled. It's true, bitch has no legs. Damn, what a gimmick. <laughs> After careful reflection, they parry in kind. We all admire the sacrifice of the Democratic's paraplegic candidate, but we should be twice as impressed by the GOP's quadriplegic candidate. Let the disability arms race begin. Meet our next Democratic co governor. He's in a coma. Call and raise, suckers. Uh, this was uh, my first reaction to the NSA uh, domestic spying scandal that's, I guess, not really a scandal if you don't have a Democratic Party to make it one. But anyway, uh, here we have the NSA in Fort Meade, Maryland. We've got an intercept. Oh, wrong, wrong way there. That's the NSA. They're doing that. Um, soon the USA, they're listening in to a broadcast, soon the U.S. Treasury will be empty and the Bill of Rights just a memory. Terrorists is trying to destroy our way of life. I'm running a trace, sir. Dispatch local law enforcement. Get the scum. Two O. Got it. The cops respond. And there's Bush, of course, and Cheney. How ironic. Idiot. Never talk outside the bunker, George. <laughs> this is uh, an idea that my wife gave me, which is why it's pretty funny. Um, why we spy on Americans instead? First of all, they're easier to track down. Because Americans are in the phone book. They speak English, so that's easier. Yo, another GNT. I know this dialect. They eat normal food. What's the matter? Never had curried lamb shank before? Act normal, act normal. They're so deep undercover, they don't know they have anything to hide. I left my computer password on the fridge in case you need to use it. I'm in! Don't all laugh at once, it's all right. I get paid the same. All right, 
This was just a straightforward quote from ABC News from November 18th, 2005. Um, CIA techniques include waterboarding in which the prisoner is bound to an inclined board, feet raised and head slightly below the feet. Cellophane is wrapped over the prisoner's face and water is poured over him. Unavoidably, the gag reflex kicks in and a terrifying fear of drowning leads to an almost instant, to almost instant pleas to bring the treatment to a halt. CIA sources said Al-Qaeda's toughest prisoner, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, won the admiration of interrogators when he was able to last between two and two and a half minutes before begging to confess. CIA officers also subjected themselves to waterboarding, but they only lasted an average of 14 seconds. No wonder we're losing the, the war on terror. 14 seconds, our guys are wimps. Now, this was about how Americans have Let's face it, how much time do we all spend talking or thinking about torture in an average day? Like, not much. And uh, so this was about how Americans have internalized um, the fact that they live in a country that is a global torturer. And speaking of torture, this was, uh, this was, my this was when John McCain, senator from Arizona and probable 2008 Republican nominee, was uh, pushing for an amendment to uh, ban torture in U.S. law, and Bush just didn't want to go along with it, which I thought uh, would be amusing to show him being tortured. Go ahead, do your worst. I'll never stop torturing. And there's McCain in the background, like, sick pup. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, shortly after he, Bush was forced to sign that law, he signed in a secret executive order uh, nullifying it. So, uh, ain't democracy grand. This, your father never got to vote under Saddam. He was so proud of his ink-stained finger. It was all we found after the car bomb. Hey, we sold the kidney for 20,000 dinars. Come on, let's look at that finger, come on. That was a good sight gag, right? Okay, this is uh, Ordnance Sans Frontières. For, there's, of course, uh, uh, Journalistes Sans Frontières and Physiciens Sans Frontières. This eight-year-old boy, once doomed to hunger and starvation in Saharan Africa, has become a proficient AK-47 gunman, thanks to Ordnance Sans Frontières. No more lining up with a bull for me, thanks to armaments without borders. My family is prosperous. Oh, and please send ammo. We will. Despair is ancient history for this Tajik farmer turned stinger missile king, and Raytheon likes the business. A passenger jet! I'll be eating fat Western tourists for months. <laughs> Some might disagree with our methods, but there's no arguing with our results. Give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Give him an RPG and he'll take over his province. <laughs> hey, let's watch the confirmation hearings. What for? The outcome is predetermined. No, no, the drum is not in the vote. The question is, will the Democrats act ornery before voting yes or not? See, that question was virtually peevish. Democracy makes me tingle. <laughs> On December 30th, 2005, Bush signed John McCain's bill banning torture of POWs. G E O R G. <laughs> Afterwards, he walked into the Oval Office where he issued a secret order nullifying it. Sign first, cocaine second. <laughs> Let no one say that Bush doesn't care about working people. 20 minute torture break! Thanks, W! I, I liked the, the arm. I was really happy with the way the arm worked out there. You know? <laughs> It's, you know, it took years to break into this profession, but these are the rewards. <laughs> yeah, this was a straightforward, truthful cartoon. I read that, uh, that in order to save money, dead soldiers are, have being, are being shipped back from Iraq as freight. That's, that's actually true. Um, and so uh, I imagined people in a waiting area uh, at the baggage carousel at the airport waiting for their luggage to come off and watching uh, coffins being unloaded. So this was sort of an attempt to uh, just sort of point out a story that maybe a lot of people have missed. Um, so we just have people trying to identify their tags and talking about um, just, you know, BS on their cell phones. What, no laughter? Um, 
I don't get it. Why didn't Bush get warrants for spying on us? The court only said no five out of 19,000 times. They're a rubber stamp. Why sneak around? They could have tapped Greenpeace's phone and applied for the warrant three days later. Maybe they didn't want the court to know who they were spying on. And then here's my imagination at work. It's like, hey, is the new wiretap working? Better, it's the PETA ladies room camera. Vegan chicks are hot. <laughs> that tattoo must have hurt. Mmm, creamy goth girls. <laughs> That's Condi Rice there on the <laughs> Janie in the middle. The world's most evil human being. Okay. Uh, now that uh, Tom DeLay and Jack Abramoff and Scooter Libby and soon Carl Rove are all going to be in the clink, um, this, I, picked, I posited this as a Republican leadership meeting. Hey, my ankle be monitoring de devices beeping. No, it's mine. That's me. Sorry, fellows, it's mine. Uh, here we have Bush on TV talk, uh, while people are watching him in a bar. If we don't fight him in Iraq, we'll have to fight him in America. Yeah, what? Well, right. Whatever, sad clown. Go ahead and laugh. I laughed at Lyndon Johnson, too. Even called him out of touch. We must fight him in Vietnam so we don't have to fight him here. Mmm, drugs. <laughs> but the long years of Vietnamese occupation turned tears of derision into eye discharges of woe. Big nose Yankee dog, we send you to Happy Ho Chi Minh Camp number six and give me your drugs. Everything went to hell. Food, street names, death camps, all because we didn't have the will to resist them in Nam. It's like goddamn goat testicle wine hangover. <laughs> Only after oppressed Americans rose up and overthrew the Vietnamese fiends did we appreciate how close we'd come to utter annihilation. And take your, super, your, your stupid non-peasant hats with you. USA, USA. What a story. Thanks for saving us, old timer. Aye, the Iraqis are here. Too late, again. I just love that argument. We have to fight them there in order to not have to fight them here. Don't these people own a globe? I mean, it's far away over there, right? They'd have to come through you know, Turkey and Europe and then take a plane. And I think we'd probably know if they were on their way. Um, I, I actually got a, a um, I came across completely by accident a newspaper article from 1971 that made the same exact argument about Vietnam, how we had to fight them over in Vietnam. Otherwise, the next thing you know, we'd be eating uh, goat testicle wine here in the United States. This was If Jesus Lived Now, my attempt to stir up the Republican right on Christmas Day. No room at the inn. Israelis bulldozed it, dude. Driving out the money changers. Hey, I work for Halliburton. You're a dead man. The trial. Sorry, no lawyer for you. They've declared you an enemy combatant. And finally, the crucifixion. Take that, terrorists. Torture rocks. USA, USA. Uh, this is maybe, I don't know how applicable this would be in Ann Arbor, but uh, I live in New York and there's like these trendy dogs that you see. Um, in, the, in the 1980s, uh, there were these uh, Akitas, which are big sort of bushy dog, Japanese breed. Um, they were so popular that there was even a chain of, of, of stores called Akitas of Distinction all over New York. And then th you'd see them everywhere. Everyone had them, but only for about six years. Now, Dogs live longer than six years, right? So I've wondered about that for years, about that logic, you know, like, I actually looked it up. I mean, different breeds have different lifespans. The average American dog lives 13.2 years. So I'm thinking, well, where do those dogs go? And so this cartoon um, is the answer to that question. Shiba Inus, the small foxy dogs that became trendy in 98, once reigned supreme in big cities. That's right, I'm ornery, cost a thousand bucks, and you have to keep, pick up my droppings, bitch. Dogs live 13 years, yet the Shiba Inu has all but vanished. Where did they go? Cute, puggle, very hip. What happened to your Shiba Inu? Never had one, go away. The Akita, the fad breed of the 80s, only lasted a few years. What happened? Children have been told not to worry. 
Did I get rid of my pet after he became embarrassing a relic as boy George? No, I did not. <laughs> however, between us adults, however, two words, school lunches. Now, after this cartoon came out, um, I, I did this cartoon just for fun. It was really just my own little rant. And, and uh, I actually heard from a number of experts in this field um, who say that it's not school lunches, don't worry, but uh, they say that it's actually true that these dogs get killed in, a north, in, in just huge numbers because pe they're hard, harder to care for than mutts and uh, people just sort of freak out and, and give them to animal shelters or abandon them. And so it's, there's a little bit of truth to this and uh, they have ended up in rendering plants and in dog food, most of them. Him, kitten. All right. So, which? All right. So, who who do we want to have up here? Who would you rather stare at while I talk? Come on, Bush or kitten? Bush? Yeah. Kitten. That's it. There's no appetite for either one. All right. So we'll just kill this. Um, can we just turn that off, maybe? Or no, IT guy, Josh? V. v. V as in boy, okay. Okay, great. Maybe the alphabet's changed or something. So, you know, uh, as a cartoonist, I'm gonna throw this out for questions like in just a minute or so, but I just wanted to point out um, that uh, the new statistics are in about civilian casualties in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I just, you know, was surfing the web before I, uh, before I came on. And it turns out that, um, well, let's go, I wanted to compare Saddam and Bush. Um, Saddam is estimated by his harshest critics to be responsible for the deaths of 400,000 Iraqis between 1979 and 2003. So that's 23 years, right? Works out to about 20,000, a little bit under 20,000 dead Iraqis a year. Pretty, you know, pretty respectable number. I mean, not, not a slouch. And um, not a slacker, you know, he's not sitting around. I mean, you know, 20,000, that's a lot of people. Um, now, as of 2000, early 2004, uh, it had been reported that uh, Bush had killed 100,000 Iraqis, all right? So I wanted to look into how many have died since then. Now, according to The Lancet and a number of more, uh, respectable sources, uh, the low estimates are about 30,000 since then. So we've got about 130,000 there. And then in Afghanistan, you know, that other war that no one thinks about anymore, uh, that's 30,000 more. We're not counting any like Iraqi or Afghan troops. I'd argue you should count them, but we're not gonna count them because they're you know, military. So that's 160,000. And uh, then that's all in four years. I think you can see where I'm going with this, right? So 160,000 divided by four is 40,000 a year. So from a political and military and safety standpoint, the world would have been safer if Saddam had invaded us and gotten rid of Bush and put him in that spider hole by a factor of two. I just think it's interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think that's an important thing for us all to become aware of. Um, I really think the Q&A thing is like by far the most interesting part of any, any kind of presentation like this, because I know myself, that sitting in the audience, it's, you know, it's kind of like, okay, I saw the cartoons, I don't want to just hear the guy talk, and, you know, I, I hate his politics or whatever, I, he can't draw, um, and I want to tell him. So anything, so seriously, I just want to throw it open for questions and be as mean as you want, because I go on Bill O'Reilly's show all the time, and so, like, I can take anything. So, so I'm really serious, and I, I will not insult you unless you're wearing something really, like, more obnoxious than my shirt. So, uh, any questions? Yes, up front. Um, so I was pretty hard working with Ben, and I find some of your stuff offensive. I still Could everyone hear the question in the back? No? All right. So the question was, uh, why do you look so good in that orange shirt? <laughs> and uh, so, no. Uh, so I, uh, yeah. So the, uh, so yeah, the question was, why do, um, 
uh, what does what do cartoons that are he said that he finds he likes my work he reads it but he finds some even though he doesn't disagree with most of it maybe but uh, there's some things that I do that are insanely offensive and uh, or inf that are offensive and what do cartoons like Terror Widows that was up during uh, Professor Gleckner's uh, introduction contribute to debate what am I thinking why am I doing it right am I is that fair yeah okay and the the, the bottom line is it's really causing offense is not something that should be the goal of a political cartoonist, but it shouldn't be something that you avoid. You should, your, the job is really to express opinions as you see things, and particularly about points, to express points of view that you yourself um, are not, are feeling that are going un, underrepresented in the media. And um, what happened with that cartoon, and the reason that it maybe caused a lot of offense, first of all, it occurred six, it took, came out six months after 9-11, when uh, you were still hearing stupid statements uh, along the lines of irony is dead, humor is dead, America will laugh, never laugh again. Uh, I still had friends who were political cartoonists who were talking about getting out of the profession because they didn't think there would be any market for what we were doing. Um, and so I think that was part of it. And I think at the same, and probably the bigger issue was the fact that uh, the, what, the events that you saw in those cartoons, Marion Pearl, the widow of Daniel Pearl, going on, on Larry King two days after her husband's death to promote her upcoming book, uh, Theodore Olson, the Solicitor General of the United States who argued Bush v. Gore for Bush, um, his wife Barbara Olson was on the flight that crashed into the Pentagon on 9-11, Three days later, 72 hours after his wife died in a brutally, just horribly, uh, he went also on Larry King to promote uh, the invasion, a possible invasion of, against Afghanistan and uh, Bush administration policies ranging from free fast track signing authority for free trade to, uh, to drilling in Anwar. Um, and there was one more, Lisa Beamer, was the widow of Todd Beamer, who was supposedly the leader of the uh, rebellion on the plane that crashed in western Pennsylvania on 9-11. Uh, the reason I say supposedly is because the 9-11 Commission found that there was never any such passenger rebellion, and it probably never occurred, um, and that they certainly never got into the cockpit uh, based on the flight data recorders. So anyway, he's the let's roll guy. And Lisa Beamer also uh, went on Larry King. Larry King was a busy guy back that week. Um, in order to promote born again Christianity uh, while using her dead husband's corpse to do so, um, at the time she was, and she kept going on and on about how fortunate he was to be in a better place. And I remember thinking, yeah, but you wouldn't switch, would you? And uh, so she, so I, you know, I saw these three things. And as my best friend, uh, Cole Smithy, the film critic, says, once, is an incident. Twice is a coincidence. Three times is a trend. And when something happens three times as a cartoonist, my little ears perk up and I think, you know, this is something that is really astonishing. You know, we're talking about the commodification of grief in order to make money, make a political point, and, uh, and, or to spread a religious belief. And, you know, I gotta say, maybe I'm crazy, but if my wife dies, I'm never gonna talk about it on television for the rest of my life, ever. And I, I don't think I'd be in any position to do anything but curl up in a ball on my bed 30, 72 hours after it happened. I'm certainly not going to go on national television and crack jokes about Larry King's tie, as Marion Pearl did. So, I, um, you know, I've been, so, I've been somewhat vindicated in the years since this happened. Uh, Lisa Beamer has become a frequent lecturer at extreme right places like Bob Jones at University. And, uh, uh, Theodore Olson has sort of vanished, but, uh, and Marion Pearl uh, has had some pretty, um, uh, well, you could Google her and you could see what's happened to her in recent years. But anyway, suffice it to say that I've been kind of vindicated about these people character, but it wasn't about smearing them. It was about making a point about culture, um, that something's just very wrong with a country that where people are willing to go and pimp their dead wives and their dead husbands in order to sell books, and, uh, and that's the point of the cartoon. And you know, beyond that, is that point worth making? Maybe not, you know, but hey, I have 150 cartoons a year to do, and so it seemed like a good topic at the time. Uh, sorry? Yeah, go, no, go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, there was just a chuckle. Okay, uh, someone else, yeah, back there. Yeah? 
What is it about the medium of cartoons that makes it effective? Um, you know, there's a, Scott McCloud wrote an entire book called Understanding Comics that attempts to, to answer that question. Uh, what is it about the unique power of cartoons? And as, you know, I write, uh, I do three things. I'm, I, besides cartoons, I also uh, draw, I also do a, um, an, a, a weekly opinion column for Universal Press Syndicate, and I also have a radio show. And it's really fascinating to, I can express some weeks the same exact thoughts in all three media, and the cartoon will invariably get the bigger reaction. And I think um, there's been a lot of theory, theorizing by people who are smarter than I am about why it works that way, but there's no denying the fact that cartoons seem to sneak up on people. They think that, I think some people think, oh, they're for kids, they look like anybody could draw them, that's particularly true in my case, and people are, um, they look, they, they don't expect them to be so outrageous, you know, they think, uh, they think, well, you know, these are going to be jokes about the news, and that's a trend that's been um, increasing in recent years. If you look at the cartoons uh, in Newsweek, um, in the New York Times on Sundays, in the Week in Review section, uh, in USA Today, and probably in any daily newspaper in the United States, you'll see a lot of jokes about things like this week, everybody's doing stupid jokes about Brokeback Mountain, right? And it's it's like, those aren't political cartoons. They're just, I mean, they might be really funny. Some of them are very funny, but they're not political cartoons. So when someone actually does a political cartoon, you know, and takes a risk and, and is willing to, to declare jihad against a point of view or an opinion or a, or, a, or, a, or a politician, you just, you know, you're gonna cause offense and it just, it takes people by surprise and they're like, cartoons are supposed to be funny. That's not funny. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's like that cartoon I showed you about the coffins rolling off the, assemb uh, off the conveyor belt. Yeah, it's not funny. I couldn't agree more. It's not funny. But it's a way to point at something. Even though that, I read that same thing in the news and I saw it on television, it's a way to point something out and say, hey, 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 look at that. And uh, people, it works sometimes. So, you know, but they do have a unique power. And uh, sort of how it works is uh, sort of something that a, uh, a theoretician, uh, you know, a postmodern theoretician would be better at explaining than me. Yeah, in the green there. How do you decide who gets into political cartooning? Well, you have to wear a really good shirt. Um, no, the question was, how do you get into political cartooning? And uh, there's no, there's no, uh, it's interesting because there are lots of schools that, um, that teach people about cartooning. There are, um, and no, no one as far as I know who's, uh, ever come out of one of those schools and become a successful cartoonist. Um, don't drop out or anything, you know, but it's, uh, you know, education's a good thing. But it's, 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 it tends to be, um, in my case, which is just unique to me, I wanted to do it since I was a little kid and didn't really know how. I did, uh, I drew for the school paper, the local paper in my little town, and I grew up south of Dayton, Ohio, um, and, uh, and then went to college did stuff for the college paper, and then got out of college and didn't know what the hell to do. And so um, I, went, I went into banking and stopped cartooning for years, and then finally I was, I was miserable, and I just decided to start cartooning, and uh, I was putting up my stuff on lampposts throughout New York City um, in order to draw attention to my work. And uh, finally, um, I got arrested. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you laugh. It's like try eating bologna, one bologna sandwich every day for three days over the holiday weekend. You always want to be arrested on the holiday weekend. Um, Friday, because you don't get a hearing until Tuesday night at 2 in the morning. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so I got arrested and um, they, uh, under the Poster Act, a very important piece of Koch era administration, uh, uh, legislation, uh, which uh, protects New Yorkers from the uh, ever-present danger of posters on their on their walls, and, um, and, and, and with dil great diligence, New York's finest and the heroes of 9-11, well, this was before 9-11, so they didn't have, they only had me to deal with, and um, they, uh, so anyway, they threw me in the lockup, and um, I challenged the case as a First Amendment case because the law was really drafted to protect, uh, to prevent people from using uh, public space for advertising and I was not using, I wasn't advertising. And I won and it got some, made some press and, and uh, got the attention of a small syndicate and, and that sort of broke me in and, and the rest has sort of been a sort of a slow climb from obscurity to 
the vastly famous person you see before you today. <laughs> um, so yeah, so anyway, that's, that's the deal. And it's, um, uh, it, you know, it, uh, I took, I've taken some art classes. I've, I've uh, been a student of cartooning just as a fan. And that's really how most cartoonists do it. They, they look at stuff that they like and they copy the things, they, they steal the things that they like and they, and they, they try to develop some new stuff and uh, they, 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 they try to uh, avoid, hopefully, not l looking like too much like other people's work, but it's a very incestuous art form. And uh, it's, uh, but there's no one way, you know? I mean, there are cartoonists who got out of, uh, who, who uh, got hired straight out of college, making a lot more money than I will ever make. Um, I hate them. And uh, that's, uh, so there's, but, but it's one story and there's no, it's uh, the only the only common thread is that you have to kick the door down to to be heard. I think um, anyone else. The question is talent versus marketing, which is more important? Clearly, marketing, um, and that is n I'm really not kidding. Uh, there are many. There's a brilliant cartoonist named Chris Kelly, or I should say, former cartoonist named Chris Kelly, who would kill me if he knew I was mentioning his name here tonight. Uh, who lives in North Carolina, who is one of my favorite alternative uh, underground cartoonists of the early 90s. And he just had the hardest time breaking in. Uh, it, it's very hard to make a living doing this, especially when you're first starting out. He only had a couple of papers. He was making $20 a week. Just wasn't worth it. And he quit and moved to LA and became an animator and is now happy, uh, but not a cartoonist anymore. And that's a story you, you hear over and over again. And conversely, there are some really untalented hacks like me who are very good at marketing. I mean, my, the big thing I did in the 80s when I had my day job was getting a job in an investment bank uh, where, they, where I had a very good friend in the mailroom. And uh, so I used to come in, sneak in early, Xerox off hundreds of cartoons and mail them using the mail meter machine uh, to all over the country, to e every editor at each of the 3,200 daily newspapers in the United States. And, um, and I would do that each and every week. So uh, I used to have paper cuts on my tongue. And uh, <laughs> because, because, you know, it's faster to use your, because I have a slurpier tongue than a, well, I didn't have those sponges, you know? So anyway, so that's why I couldn't get a date during that period. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, Alan is pointing out that um, <laughs> that, I, that you can't belittle the talent side, and, and she's right. In all seriousness, um, I think what happens is that the marketing gets you is good at getting you the break, um, and there are but you do have to have the talent first. I mean, you have to have something that appeals to someone is really the answer to that. It's not really about being good; it's about the, the gatekeepers thinking that you're good. And that's maybe the big thing. You know, people always say, well, you have to appeal to the readers. I don't have to appeal to the readers at all. I only have to appeal to my editors. If my editors think I'm great, uh, I don't care if the rest of y'all think I suck because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in, right? I mean, it's, so I need, really, I have 140 newspapers. That means I have 140 masters, and, um, and that's it. And I think that uh, when, you're, when you're first breaking in, uh, there are, uh, you, you, the marketing will get, your, will get your stuff seen. The talent will hopefully show to a person who is open-minded enough to maybe see that you're not doing the same thing that he or she is used to seeing. And, uh, and the marketing might follow that, might remind them to pay more attention to you in the future. But I think it's true, I don't, you know, I'm just not a free market person. I don't think that the best stuff always wins, whether in cartooning or in, in products. I mean, look at VHS versus Beta or, you know, Mac, you know, Wendy's versus McDonald's or any of these examples where things that are better don't do as well as things that are worse. Um, and I think, uh, so I would always concentrate on the marketing first, but, but it's true, you should, it helps to be talented. Yeah. Have ever thought of working for Marvel or DC? Marvel or DC? No, um, although you could say that I arguably work for DC now because I do cartoons for Mad Magazine. So I am, uh, Mad Magazine is owned by DC Comics and I receive a paycheck. But I don't draw, I don't think, I'm, I'm not good enough to draw like those guys. Um, 
And I don't, it's not, yeah, I don't want to, but I couldn't anyway, so, you know, I mean, it sort of doesn't matter. It's, uh, you know, it's like I'm never going to be in the NFL, I don't want to be, I couldn't be, it's, it's great, everyone wins. Yeah, yeah. Why do I make political cartoons? Um, well, you know, it's funny. When I first, my, my, the, the idea first crossed my mind when I met, when I was uh, 15 and I was a kid and I, through a series of sort of weird coincidences, I met edit, uh, Mike Peters, who's the editorial cartoonist for the Dayton Daily News. I went to his office, met him and his wife. And for me, it started out as, life, as, as a lifestyle, believe it or not. Um, it was, here's a guy who, in a town where there's only three major employers, and National Cash Register, uh, the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and Mead Paper Corporation, who make your spiral-bound notebooks. Um, the, here's a guy who is paid, he can wear anything he wants, uh, works in, a, in an office with a drunk sports writer crashed out on his sofa, and, is, and, and gets paid to make fun of the President of the United States. I was like, that's pretty cool. And, uh, and, and, it, and in a way, it kind of all comes back to that for me. It was like, I'm not even kidding. It really was about seeing that, um, you know, like, that guy has a great life. I want to have that life. And then, um, of course, obviously, it wouldn't have worked that way. I mean, you know, like, being a dictator would be cool, too, right? And I didn't work towards that. Um, so, I'm like a certain boy from, from Texas. So, so the, um, so it's, so, it, so in terms of, which brings me sort of to why do I keep doing it? Why do I, why do I draw political cartoons? And I think it's because I think they're a cool medium. I think they have a lot of power, uh, even though they're kind of a dying medium. Uh, there's uh, only, there's fewer than 50 working editorial cartoonists in the United States today. At the, 100 years ago, there were over 1,000. Um, so it's a dying medium. Uh, but I thought, you know, I can ride this out until I retire. I'm 42, you know, I only have 23 years to go. It's like no one will notice that the medium's dead until then. And, and, it's, uh, and I think that it's also become, you know, there's been different reasons to do it. It used to be under the Clinton years sort of a way to, to get at interesting, um, obscure trends in American society. And now uh, it's a way to, it's in a way like the, the only place where you can freely uh, say what you want um, and in the newspaper. So, uh, so in a way, it's become far more important than that since 9-11, but it's more of a chore to, uh, yeah, than you. That's a good question. Uh, the question was, you know, how pow with the medium being dying and uh, how powerful are car editorial cartoons next to other forms of punditry like columns and, uh, and uh, television talking head shows uh, like, like Bill O'Reilly. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to point out that these cartoonists did not just decide to quit. Um, the newspapers are system systematically uh, eliminating editorial cartoons. Uh, the, um, and part of it has been that newspapers are going out of business. So, I mean, how many people, this is something I wanted to ask, by the way, how many people here read the newspaper every day? Including online, Including online yeah, online. Online, certainly online. Yeah, maybe one out of ten, right? And this is in a university town, right? How many people read two newspapers every day? Online. Yeah, one, even half, maybe half, less than half, fewer than half of that. Um, so that's pretty astonishing, right? I mean, people don't read the newspaper. Newspapers are going out of business. They're, and of course, in turn, because newspapers have become more small c conservative because they're worried about losing their circulation, uh, they become less daring and therefore less appealing. And uh, it just sort of becomes a snake eating its tail and it gets worse and worse. And, um, and then also editors are uh, more scared to run controversial uh, matter in their paper. So uh, cartoons tend to be more difficult to control. As a, editorial, as a former top editor at the New York Times told me, uh, we, don't run editorial, we don't run cartoons every day because we cannot edit them. They're, they're sort of rogue. And, uh, so, uh, and also, there's also some economic reasons, too. It's cheaper to buy syndicated material than it is to hire people on staff. And uh, sort of what happens is that everyone wants to buy syndicated material from people who are on staff somewhere else, but then it's kind of like, 
uh, we'll fire our staffer and then hire and, and buy stuff from syndicated cartoons. But where are those people going to get their, their, their salaries that, that subsidize these low syndication rates? And so anyway, the bottom line is that cartoonists are disappearing. I think that um, the power is potentially as vast as Bill O'Reilly's. Um, but unfortunately, if you're deprived of a voice and you're being fired, and you don't, and people aren't reading newspapers anymore, then by definition, they are obviously weaker. I mean, television's the place. If I could, if I was only interested in um, exerting a political influence, I would just put, devote all my energies to getting a TV show. And I would have to wear blue shirts. But, um, but, I, but that would be, I think TV is obviously huge. I mean, anybody, who could deny the power of, Fox News, right? I mean, who could? It's, uh, it, it spins the, um, it, it, the way that it manages to spin uh, the, the news every minute of every day for millions of people, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's, uh, it's, you know, they could make black seem white and white seem black and, yeah. Do I ever get tired and run out of righteous anger? Only when the dry cleaner smashes the buttons on my pretty orange shirt. No, I'm going to stop talking about this shirt. I'm sorry. Um, it's a, uh, I mean, I don't, th probably not. As long as pol there are politicians, politicians will be stupid. And people who are in charge don't have the right to be stupid because their decisions uh, cause life and death to human beings every single day and impacts all of our lives. Even something stupid like a, a, a local politician who makes a decision that causes everyone to wait in traffic five extra minutes before, before they get home because they designed the intersection wrong is causing millions of hours of untold man misery to, to human beings. And that person is scum. And it's, so people, so there has to be people who stand up and yell about it because Americans are working, you know, 50, an average of 51 hours a week now. And uh, they're, they're, they're busy. They come home, um, they're tired, they have, they have a mortgage to pay or rent to pay, and you know, they, they, there are people like me who are paid to raise hell, and we're not really even doing our job enough at all. Um, you know, God knows there's no Democratic Party. Um, so, yeah. Are there new venues for comics, political comics? Uh, yeah, you know, the internet is huge. In fact, I'm editing, I edit these, uh, this series of, um, this, of anthologies about, um, of alternative comics called, the, uh, called Attitude. I didn't name it, I hate the name, but it, it sells pretty well, so I don't complain. And the, um, the next third volume, Attitude 3, is coming out um, later in a few months, and it's only about web comics, internet comics. And some of them are political, some of them are social commentary, some of them are just straightforward humor. And they're really, some of them are just great, you know? I mean, in terms of creativity, they're every bit as good or better than a lot of the stuff that you'll see in magazines or newspapers. Um, the problem is economic. Nobody's figured out how to get paid for, uh, for web comics. And there's been different proposals. There's um, programs that, that, there's people who sort of posit that you would pay a nickel every time you looked at a, at a cartoon online. Uh, the problem with that is it's through credit cards, right? And credit cards always have to charge a flat fee, so how would you do these little micropayments? Nobody's really worked that out. Uh, there's also the fact that people don't like to pay for online comment. I don't. Whenever it's like, register here, I like immediately leave, you know, pull out of the screen, right? Most people do. So I just, so the, um, the problem is that, yes, there's, there's this venue to distribute work. Essentially, these people are doing what I did by posting my stuff up on the street. They can get exposure. But how do they move on to the next level and turn it into a living? Or you might say, well, that doesn't matter. It does matter. Because if people don't, um, because if people have uh, those extra 40 hours a week or 51 hours a week that they're not spending at their day job to spend on their comics, they're going to do more comics. They're going to be better. They're going to they're be able to take it more seriously. So yeah, you had a follow-up? Yeah, bloggers are doing it. Why not cartoonists? 
because we're lazy. Um, I, no, there are people who do it. In fact, there's some cartoonists who actually uh, have a blog to go with their cartoons. And that's a model that's very powerful. And I don't mean to say that nobody's doing it. I mean, they're, like the most successful model that I've seen in web comics has been the merchandising angle. Like people who do kind of really super cute and cool looking comics are able to sell t-shirts and make a considerable amount of money from that, enough to survive. So it can be done, it's just that the bar is higher than back in the day when um, every little local paper in America hired a cartoonist to draw about local and state politics. That was just, you know, that was 1,200 spots. Um, you know, so it's, what you have is a, there's a, there was a book that came out a few years ago called The Winner Take All Society that you could probably get for like a dollar on Amazon now. And it's, but it's great because it sort of explains this whole like fact that, um, that people, you know, like if you win a gold medal in the Olympics, you're going to be, you're going to get a zillion endorsements and everyone's going to know who you are. If you win the silver, you might as well have stayed home on your ass and watched it on TV because no one knows who you were, right? And that wasn't like that. 30 years ago, if you were a bronze medal winner, you probably could have gotten some endorsements. Um, and so what's happening is that as people absorb more pop culture, they're busier, they, they're online all the time, they're absorbing more information than ever before, nobody really knows very much about any particular thing, they just know a little bit about a lot. And so uh, it's, it's affecting everything, and this is just one way in which that's happening, and so it's like harder, yeah, behind there. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, the, I'm, uh, it was point, um, the question, well, it wasn't a question, just pointing out that I'm a, uh, also a graphic novelist. And uh, it's funny, the reason I, um, and it, I started out in 96, I did a graphic novel form. Like, nobody really knows what a graphic novel is. Uh, it's in kind of, I think the best definition is it's just a long comic book, usually um, with a square bound, perfect bound um, uh, spine. But it's a, uh, but in my case, I started out doing a book called Real Americans A Bit the Worst Thing I've Ever Done in 96. And uh, I did a, an update and parody of George Orwell's 1984 called 2024 that came out in 2001. And then uh, in 2002, I did a book called To Afghanistan and Back, which was about, I, was, um, I did a, some war correspondency during the US invasion of Afghanistan in the fall of 01. So I came back and very quickly turned around and did a book that was half graphic novella, 50 pages of comics that sort of showed what it, it was like over there. And then uh, book ended with a bunch of pieces that I'd filed from there. And, uh, and so that, in, and that right now I'm working on a new graphic novel that's kind of a follow up to that. And um, those are, um, I started out doing it just because it was hip at the time and everyone was doing it. And uh, as a creative person, you know, you kind of should try things just because everybody's doing them sometimes. And, uh, and it allow, you know, I mean, seriously, it's, uh, you, you, if when there's a new medium out there, it's kind of like I know cartoonists who still won't, like at MAD, for instance, the old timers who are in their 80s, uh, they don't know how to use the internet. They don't scan their work. They bring in the boards like in the old days and they're painted and stuff. They're awesome. You know, there's, these are like masters, people who really draw well. And, uh, and, but you know, it's kind of like they're, they're, they're Luddites and you know, it's, it's fine. But uh, you know, when there's this opportunity to spread out creatively and do 200 pages comic, you know, you're just able to do things that you can't do in a seven and a half by 10 piece of paper three times a week. And um, so I found it kind of interesting and rewarding that way. Uh, most of my graphic novels have sold pretty well. Uh, one was a bomb but uh, 2024, um, and uh, the, please buy it, but the, the print run's still out there, and you know, we need to kill that print run. Um, but, that, uh, but for the most part, they've sold well, so it turns out that the syndicated stuff contributes to marketing um, this stuff, because uh, people see the graphic, you know, they see a bunch of graphic novels on a shelf, they recognize your style and your name from the newspaper, it helps sell the book. Um, and that, so there is, you know, I find that there's a lot of cross-pollination as a cartoonist, both creatively and economically. And economics are a big part of this. I mean, people don't talk about it enough as artists, but you know, you don't get to be an artist unless you can pay your bills. And 
you know, I don't like the starving artist thing. Yeah. Talk a little bit about South Park. A little bit about South Park. No. Um. Um. Well, what do you want to know about? I mean, what about it? I don't work on it, so it's. Okay, well, I just said a little bit about South Park. No, um, I like it. It's fine. Uh, you know, it's not my favorite, not my least favorite. It's, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, those guys, uh, Team America, though. That's funny shit. Uh, you know, oh my God, I just saw it like on Netflix a couple of weeks ago. I was dying. I can't believe it wasn't hu huger than it was, but it was pretty big. But, um, uh, you know, it sort of shows what you can do with a budget, you know. Um, Team America. See it if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, only on my way to get coffee and stuff. Uh, no, this is it. So if this sucked, I'm sorry. Um, you're just gonna. That's all I could do. I did my best. Yeah. Um, so in an effort to make me feel old, I was reminded that uh, that he grew up with my work. Um, and, uh, and that uh, in, max in Maximum Rock and Roll, but at the same time, his mom saw my uh, stuff in Newsweek. And so what's it like to, what's that all about to be in two places at the, you know, to some, a place as alternative as the punk zine, Ma MRR, Maximum Rock and Roll, and Newsweek, and I love it. It's like the best thing ever. I, it's, I love the fact that um, I've been able to have this crossover appeal, you know, where I can, uh, where my stuff can appear in, uh, in alternative venues and mainstream venues. Um, and it's, I love not being pigeonholed. I don't want to just appear in, you know, like for instance, uh, the nation and the progressive and which don't run me anyway, but you know, it's just to be like, you know, very narrow casted kind of, um, you know, sort of certain acceptable liberal place. I mean, there's nothing to me more thrilling than to appear in some weird place. A friend of mine came back from covering uh, the, uh, I forget her name, the woman in, uh, who went missing in Aruba. Um, he was covering that case down there and uh, he came back with a copy of the paper in Aruba that apparently had been ripping off my cartoons and publishing them surreptitiously. Um, but it's still cool that I was in Aruba, you know, and uh, and so uh, it's, 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 I love, I, you know, it's kind of like, again, it, 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 that boils down to the same thing that I was talking about before, about my 140 masters, right? It's like, you know, the, there's, no, there's no telling. An editor at Newsweek likes your stuff, an editor at Maximum Rock and Roll likes it, great. You don't know why, the, you know, you don't know how that happens, but meanwhile, you know, the progressive, I should be in the progressive. And, uh, you know, even graphically, politically, but they won't have any part of me, right? So it's, so it's very, so you kind of have the things that you shouldn't have and you don't get the things that you should have and it doesn't make any sense at all. And I've never been able to figure it out. So it's, you know, yeah. Oh, I love that question. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, you know, I said that I could say anything I wanted, but are, are there certain things that I cannot say that I'd like to say? And um, the, I guess the short answer is that you can't make fun of 9-11 widows without having Alan Keyes getting on your ass. But it's, uh, there's, there's, there's things that are hard to get published. Um, you can say, as a syndicated cartoonist, you can, you can send the cartoons out. But your newspaper, but you're going to real. But the thing is that your papers are going to run some stuff and run and not run others. The stuff that they choose not to run, uh, if that happens too often, they're going to cancel you, and then you're going to lose a client. And if that happens too often, you're going to be out of business. So you have to you have to watch it. And I've certainly noticed and talked with other cartoonists about the sort of topics and points of view that end up not getting run in the paper. The big one, hands down, is free trade. If you do a cartoon opposing NAFTA, WTO, uh, any kind of free trade policy. No newspaper in the United States, including an alternative New weekly, will run it. It doesn't matter how mellow it is. I mean, I, you, you could more, terror widows, that ran in newspapers all over the United States. But you cannot, 
if you say, if you want to do a cartoon that's really straightforward, that points out job losses under NAFTA, for instance, forget it. It'll never run. Doesn't matter how good it is, how well drawn it is, doesn't matter how brilliant the cartoonist, it will never appear anywhere. And there's lots of stuff like that, um, where you end up drawing it for your own portfolio, really, or to put in a book, maybe. But um, it's, uh, I, I think that would be one, oh, you know, another one. These days, in the United States, it's totally okay to be against the war in Iraq. I mean, hell, everyone is, right? It's only got a 37% approval rating. But in the war in Afghanistan, even on the left, even on the left, you have to be, you have to think that one was okay. The official talking point is uh, among the American left is that, uh, th is that the war in Afghanistan was the real one, then Bush got distracted by Iraq, and the hunt for Al-Qaeda and Osama ended when we pulled out of Afghanistan and went to Iraq. So when you try to send out cartoons that talk about the war in, Af that criticize the war in Afghanistan as being just as based on oil and just as illegitimate and illegal and just as not based on fighting terrorism as the war in Iraq, you will never get that cartoon in print. It doesn't matter even in the most orthodox lefty magazines or papers. It doesn't matter. So there's, there's lots of stuff like that. And it's, it's, it's weird because you almost, in an odd way, get more censored by the left as a lefty cartoonist than you do by the right. When I used to do stuff for the Wall Street Journal, and uh, editorial page, which is pretty much to the right of Attila the Hun, the, um, or um, Fortune Magazine, which by no means was a liberal paper uh, magazine. Uh, no censorship ever. I didn't even have to submit a rough draft. I was just sending the cartoon, they printed it, I got my paycheck, it was beautiful. Um, the Nation, oh, it's, like, it's like working for Der Commissar. Uh, you know, it's like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So, sorry, uh, behind you there was someone, no? Yeah. Death threats. There's metal detectors out there, right? In the lobby, I, there were, they told me there were gonna be, no. Um, uh, you know, it, yes, uh, the short answer is yes, I do get death threats for my work. Uh, it happened at its peak after this Tara Widow's cartoon and a cartoon that I did about um, Pat Tillman, the NFL player who died in Afghanistan on, in a friendly fire accident. Uh, those, when the Tara Widow's thing happened, it was like a, it was like a cluster of contempt and hatred and I was, bare, I was so caught by surprise that I barely knew how to handle it. Um, when the Pat Tillman thing happened, I kind of recognized it for what it was, so I kept a careful tally of all the emails and phone calls that came in. And there were 6,000 phone uh, emails that came in in a three-day period um, that expressed negative sentiments about that cartoon, uh, mostly driven by Fox, uh, the Drudge Report, and, uh, and right-wing talk radio all over the United States, including Rush Limbaugh. And of those 6,000 um, emails, 440 were threats of death or dismemberment. Um, and, uh, and then uh, and I, there were a number of people who also called. I, cal I tallied the phone calls. I'm unlisted, right? So that's not scary at all. And, <laughs> and uh, of, the, of the calls, there were 30, a little bit over 30, I think, um, death threats of whom fully 10 were traceable to law enforcement or some other kind of official. Uh, you know, like caller ID, like NYPD, 29th Precinct. Some people, very, I'm not even kidding, you know, like they, they very helpfully left their names and ranks and returned phone numbers should I choose to engage them. Um, you know, like, hey, I'm, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is Captain Bill Murray at, uh, well, not, you know, at the 29th Precinct in Brooklyn. I'm at 472-1999, and I'm coming to kill you, so why don't you call me back, and, <laughs> and we'll talk about this thing. So, so, so who are you going to call, the cops? I mean, it's a, um, and it happened a lot. It, it's, uh, it was, just, and, it, and it's, it can be disturbing. I mean, I had, I lived in an apartment building in New York at the time, and I used to have to, I, I was scared. I had my super let me out through a back alley so I didn't have to go in case someone was lurking outside my front door. Um, I used to always check behind me and take roundabout routes, uh, not take the same subway, 
uh, just try to be as low key as possible. And then like while this Pat Tillman thing was going on, like about four days afterwards, I'm waiting for the subway at, in, in, at West 4th Street Station in Lower Manhattan, and uh, I hear this boy booming, like, Ted Wall, it's you! And I'm like, I turn around, and it was just like this, it was just this guy who had met me at a book signing in Phoenix like four years earlier. I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> and, and I was like, I was so scared. I was like, oh. So, yeah, it, you know, so it happens, and it gets to you, and it's, um, you know, it's nothing, it's nothing like it happens in the third world. Like, um, I have a friend who's a cartoonist in Cameroon, who uh, has been repeatedly jailed, beaten, tortured by the regime there for his political cartoons. Uh, similarly, there's another cartoonist from Iran that that's been happening to. Um, so really, it's just a, it's mostly bluster, right? If you read this book, The Gift of Fear, uh, they'll sort of, they said something very comforting, which is that people who are coming to kill you don't threaten you. They just do it. That's the comforting thought. I saw someone back there. Oh, I love that question. Uh, what, <clears throat> who are my sources for material that I cover that's not covered by the mainstream media? Um, and uh, my, you know, among the mainstream sources that I use are just probably the same thing as, the, as everyone else who's uh, a, p a political pundit in the post 9-11 era, and that means you're reading the European press. Um, it's, uh, yes, it's lovely to live in a third world country. Um, so th the BBC, the, uh, the Guardian, The Independent, Le Monde, Libération, I read French so it's helpful. Uh, the, I also have for some things, I have some sources that I've cultivated over the years who work uh, in Washington and, um, and who, are, uh, who are very helpful at times and have um, helped me to confirm whether a story that's just breaking and sounds a little weird is actually really true or not and whether I can run with it. Because a big part of the game here is to get your cartoon out as quickly as possible after something happens so that it's still pertinent and you want to make sure. The problem is that you're really hanging out in the wind if you're not if you send something out and it turns out to have been wrong. Um, sort of an example that, sort of a pseudo example of that was two weeks ago when um, the US, uh, a US Predator drone fired a Hellfire, four Hellfire missiles at three houses in, eastern, in western Pakistan and uh, in trying to kill Al Qaeda's number two guy. And um, when the dust cleared, it turned out that they'd actually killed 22 civilians, including five children and five women. And at the time, um, the official report from Pakistani intelligence was that they had not got, it was all in a sense, it was just a big screw up. So I called up my friend who was in a position to know whether, what the situation was, and he confirmed the official accounts. And then three days, three, three days later, the Pentagon came out with this cockamamie story. Well, okay, we didn't get the guy we are after. But it was just as good because we got like numbers like 17, 22, and 444 in Al-Qaeda also. Uh, so they were bad people. Yeah, we also killed those civilians, but they were, you know, having dinner with these bad people, as the bad guys, as Bush likes to call them. Um, and, uh, and so I was really kind of like, oh, no, did I, stick, did I stick my neck out on that week's column? in that week's cartoon, um, did I screw up? And in a sense, I wouldn't have, because all I was doing was reacting to the news, but I still kind of felt bad about it. Called up my friend, and it was like, it was a cover story. It was a cover story. So um, uh, it's probably not true. And, uh, and so I feel a little bit better about it. And so the, um, because you know, if you, read the, if you read between the lines, there's no, uh, they didn't find the bodies, right? They're uh, so, Anyway, so I'm being told that we are, that, that Brokeback Mountain is about to uh, show, so uh, I'll be drawing my funny cartoons about it. Thank you very much.